This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Good Monday. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. And this show is Mina Marco and me on Mondays, of course. And we have Mina Morita on the, on the phone from Kauai. Hi, Mina. Say hi. Hi, Jay. I knew you'd say that. Um, <laughs> Mina Morita is a, a consultant in energy dynamics, and she's also a former chair of the PUC, uh, and she's also a former legislator of the Hawaii State uh, Legislature. We also have Marco Mangelsdorf, uh, who is, um, uh, gee, he teaches uh, energy. He runs uh, ProVision Solar in Hilo, and um, he knows tons about uh, energy models and every other thing about solar and batteries and what we're doing in the world on energy here in Hawaii. Uh, and that's uh, Marco Mangos. So Marco, say hi. Buenos dias, amiga y amigo. Con mucho gusto. Hello, you guys. Great to be on again. <laughs> All right. So our agenda today on uh, Me to Marco and Me is to, uh, you know, find out what's going on and the sea changes around the state on uh, on energy, especially renewable energy, and uh, Mina, you're up first because you have to tell us about the Tom Gorak case uh, that's pending in the courts. Okay. Okay, so um, about a week and a half ago on December 7th, the Hawaii Supreme Court heard the oral arguments on the uh, Morita versus Gorak case, and this is where um, Thomas Gorak, um, who was named the commissioner by the governor after Michael Champley's term expired on uh, June 30th, 2015, uh, removed Champley despite a state law saying that the um, incumbent commissioner stays beyond his term until his successor is um, appointed and confirmed by the legislature, by the state senate. Mm -hmm. And so I, I challenged the governor's action and lost in the circuit court and um, was appealing in the Intermediate Court of Appeals. And the Supreme Court accepted our petition to hear the case mm -hmm. because it is a case of first impression um, in, in Hawaii. And um, so we were really pleased with that, that, you know, we didn't have to argue before the ICA, um, have it appealed by either party, but mm -hmm. it went straight to the Supreme Court. So who, who so argued on December 7th? Who, who were the lawyers who appeared um, on the case, Mina? Basically, what the state is trying to do is change the definition of vacancy, which really means an empty office, um, and it's pretty well established in jurisprudence. And they want the term vacancy to include the end of a set term. So the state appears to parse each paragraph in the interim appointments clause in the Hawaii State Constitution mm. and ignore um, a previous paragraph where the words also say, as provided by law. So a lot of the questioning um, from the justices dealt with trying to define what um, nomination, appointment, confirmation, and qualification means. But I thought one thing that was really interesting was when the Chief Justice, um, Chief Justice Reckenwald, questioned the state on whether the PUC, the Public Utility Com Commission, was one of the nine principal departments of the state. And of course the answer is no, mm -hmm. because the PUC is legislatively formed mm -hmm. and, um, and, and said that the constitutional provisions seem to apply just to the nine principal departments. And he asked um, pointedly if the state was invalidating statutes, which the state said no. And then he asked them, why aren't we referring to the statutory provisions? 
and how can you read and avoid as provided by law in the Constitution? Mm -hmm. So, um, so I think you know it comes down to the state defining vacancy, and if this new de definition by the recent Attorney General's appointment will stand up to the court scrutiny mm -hmm. of um, the state relying on the government on just this interim provision clause and ignoring state statute, which allows um, the incumbent. Um, commissioner to stay on until uh, his successor is, is appointed and qualified. So do you feel that um, the court is sympathetic and understands your argument? I, you know, the questions are all over the place. Um, but I think when you kind of delve into the key issues on, on you know, it is it, was the governor correct in relying on the um, interim clause, appointment clause in this case, and whether they accept the um, attorney's broadening the definition of vacancy? Mm -hmm. That's the key question. Mm -hmm. Who appeared? Who appeared for your side, and who appeared for the government side? So. Um, was the question who argued for my side and who argued for the state side? Yeah, yes. Okay. For my side, my attorney was, my original attorney was the former attorney general, um, Mike Bennett. Mm -hmm. And then for the appeal, I used um, um, Harold Bronstein from Kauai. Mm -hmm. And then the state had two deputy attorney generals um, there and the one that was arguing, I, I believe her last name was um, Marie Iha. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, uh, okay, if, what's the time? Uh, uh, sorry, Marco, you had something. Yeah, if I could ask um, a clarifying question of you, Mina. So, practically speaking, if the court rules your way in in the direction that you'd like them to uh, to decide. And you have a PUC commissioner whose term ends on a given June 30th, which is outside the normal legislative uh, schedule in terms of session, right? And right. that particular commissioner chooses not to, to, to resign. And right. does that essentially mean that the governor the chief executive of the state, does not have the power and authority to put in place his own uh, nominee, his or her own nominee, starting July 1st, that he or she, the governor, wouldn't be able to do that uh, until the next legislative session, which is uh, six plus months out. In other words, does the chief executive have to, uh, have to put up with or have to accept conceivably a PUC commissioner, not of his or her own choosing, who chooses not to vacate his or her office as one of the three commissioners uh, starting on July 1st. That's maybe kind of a convoluted way to ask the question. You understand what I'm asking? Okay, yeah, yeah. So, so you know, you rely on the governor's good faith that he will make a timely appointment. You know, that a uh, uh, timely, I'm sorry, not an appointment, but nomination that, and this is what is typically done, that knowing that the um, term ends on June 30th, not only for the commissioner's position, but a lot of boards and commissions, what the governor does is send down a nominee during the legislative session who gets, um, reviewed and um, confirmed, given advice and consent by the Senate in time for them to take their position on July 1st. Prior to and that this June didn't 30th. Happen. Yeah. Yes. So if a given uh, yeah. member of the PUC doesn't want to resign after his term is up or her term is up, then he can stay in office he, until... Uh, but, but, until he's yeah, replaced the, the in the next is, session. It's not that he doesn't want to end at the, when his, his um, term ends, but the law states 
the, the um, 269-2 states that the incumbent commissioner remains as a commissioner until his successor is appointed mm. and qualified. Mm. Mm. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm concerned about this. I mean, this might affect, if, if you win on this, if this turns out to be the scenario, um, then it would affect not only the PUC, but all interim appointments, right? And, and that would be a real Pandora's right. box kind of problem, wouldn't it? Right, right. So, so the thing is, you know, it relies on everybody doing their job, right? Everybody has a job. The governor has to send down timely nominations. And, you know, the reverse can happen where this, um, this can be abused, where, where a, a person can sit almost a year in a position without re receiving advice and consent. Mm-hmm. So um, yeah. under your approach, so what do you then think, David Ige, what, what do you what, think politically? I mean, because I mean, the, the decision to uh, to remove Mike Champley, I think, can't be viewed in any other way that it was uh, highly political. What do you think the the governor's motivation was prior to that June 30th, uh, 2016? What was the governor's motivation uh, during that prior session from January to May of 2016 to, to not go ahead and nominate, propose and nominate uh, to the Senate a, a replacement uh, commissioner for Mike Champley once Champley's term ended? Yeah, I, mean, I, I don't know what his motivation is. That's something that has to be asked about the governor. But they went through great lengths to throw out two previous attorney general opinions that have stood for more than um, 30 years, almost 40 years, regarding the uh, appointment nomination confirmation process. Well, I take it, uh, even if you win, the solution for this governor or any other governor would be just to uh, appoint the successor before the term of the sitting commissioner is over. Uh, I guess you're right. saying that if, if he had appointed a, a successor during the, the session in 2016, 2016, yeah, um, and it had been that successor had been confirmed, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Exactly, exactly. And and, and if the com and you know that commission, sorry, Marco, go ahead, Marco. Sorry, if the commission, if a commissioner, as they do sometimes, decide to uh, vacate their commis commissionership, so to speak, their position there at the PUC, uh, sometime other than the end of uh, of their given term, then there is a vacancy, and at that vacancy time, uh, if it happens outside the time when the legislature meets, then the governor is within his or her power to go ahead and put in as soon as possible an interim appointment which is not subject to uh, to Senate confirmation, at least until, unless the Senate were to convene a special session or the Senate convenes during its normal session. In other words, if there's a vacancy outside of the legislature uh, session, legis legislative session, then the governor can go ahead and fill that vacancy uh, as soon as possible, right? Correct, correct. Yeah. Because, you know, a vacancy is created, it means that the seat is empty, the vacancy is created by either um, death or resignation, and he has every right um, constitutionally to use the interim appointments clause. Nobody, nobody's really arguing that, mm -hmm. um, but just for the fact that now they're including in the state is including in the definition of vacancy the end of a set term when do you anticipate a decision i have no idea you know it's just <laughs> out of our hands and you just sit and wait okay well speaking of waiting why don't we wait on a one minute break now we take a short break uh with mina and marco and me we'll be right back after these messages
There's got to be solution How to make a brighter day everyone. I'm DeSoto Brown, the co-host of Human Humane Architecture, which is seen on Think Tech Hawaii every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. And with the show's host, Martin Despang, we discuss architecture here in the Hawaiian Islands and how it not only affects the way we live, but other aspects of our life, not only here in Hawaii, but internationally as well. So join us for Human Humane Architecture every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. Okay, we're back, we're live. I'm Jay Fidel, this is Think Tech. We're talking Mina, Marco, and me. And uh, we are joined by Mina and Marco, uh, that's Mina Morita and Marco Mangelsdorf by Skype from Kauai and the Big Island, respectively. Uh, so let's talk now about the 10th anniversary of the HCEI, the Hawaii Clean Energy Initiative. Uh, it, it feels like all of 10 years. We've been through a lot in these 10 years. So what are your thoughts here at the end of 2017? What are your thoughts about the 10th anniversary of the initiative. Marco, you go first. Well, it's certainly been an interesting uh, 10 years, and uh, as I've said a number of times before, uh, I believe the progress that we've made as far as offsetting combustion, fossil fuel-based power generation has been laudatory and been uh, fairly impressive. Uh, on the transportation side, it's been uh, um, far from laudatory or impressive. So. I think you know, things are more complicated now than they were 10 years ago in terms of our finite uh, and isolated electric grids being able to accommodate the degree of uh, rooftop solar and renewable energy, distributed energy resources. Uh, 10 years ago, the penetration of rooftop solar and, and DER in general was uh, considerably less than it is now. So I think we're uh, seeing more of the practical, uh, technological uh, limitations, at least in terms of integrating renewables in, in finite grids. We're seeing a lot more of the challenges uh, now compared to when the parties, the governor, then Linda Lingle and Connie Lau from HEI and others uh, uh, signed that document. So uh, we're, we're definitely in a, in a more kind of challenging space right now. I think a lot of the kind of low-hanging fruit has been picked, and it's just much more, much more challenging. Yeah, Mina, how about you? I mean, and uh, on the question of transportation, Mina, I, I note that Ford Fujikami, who was a, um, a, he was talking a lot about trying to bring transportation forward and making it clean and including requirements for clean energy and transportation. Well, he's now moved to be uh, Mike McCartney's uh, successor as chief of staff, so he's no longer with the Department of Transportation. I'm interested in your thoughts about how that will affect things. Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, I agree a lot with Marco. It was probably the best move at the time to you know, really concentrate on research in um, uh, getting moving the political will um, in in one direction at that time, and that definitely now the issues are more complicated, especially when we bring in um, the transportation piece because you're no longer dealing with regulated entities. You're de dealing with, um, you know, the marketplace. Um, and uh, important infrastructure issues. And I think where we have our, our biggest challenge is there's still a lot of um, coordination research and application of the research that needs to be done and we no longer have a federal partner in this um you know this is strictly a state initiative now and can we do it on our own um without you know the help of the national labs and the department of energy yeah right this is a, a difficult time and maybe difficult for years to come. 
Well, what about uh, the Department of Transportation? Does Ford Fujikami's uh, transfer mean anything to the Energy Initiative for Clean Transportation? Well, I, you know, one of the biggest concerns I always had as a legislator with the Clean Energy Initiative is the, a change in administration. Mm -hmm. That, you know, usually when there's, you need continuity when you're talking about these really big, complex infrastructure issues. And, um, you know, election year coming up, you got the governor playing musical chairs with some of the key people that um, within his cabinet, and you know you wonder if they can, if the momentum can be sustained mm. um, after after election. Yeah, but it's all about trying to avoid distraction. You know, it's trying to stay on course. So if uh, HDEI yeah. was a big deal for the future of the state. Uh, it's easy to be distracted, and then, as you say, we lose momentum. So we're at risk for that now. Yeah. Right. Well, let's so let's go to our last uh, topic today, which is the uh, Tesla Powerwall, and uh, we have a real live uh, witness to how it works with Marco. He installed one. So uh, can you talk about that, Marco? How 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 what's it like, and how is it working? Uh, I'd be happy to. Yes. Uh, Kind of a little bit of background. So there are somewhere, uh, somewhere around 80,000, 80,000 plus grid type PV systems across the state, across the uh, the island chain, and the vast majority of those PV systems have no battery storage, which means that if the grid were to go down, their PV system would produce uh, provide uh, uh, no value to them. And I think this is especially kind of timely in that. Uh, there's been a fair amount of coverage recently in New York Times, Washington Post, uh, the fact that Puerto Rico, which got clobbered not by just one but two hurricanes within a couple of weeks, uh, they're only 60% uh, back online. In other words, 40% or so of the population have no access to power still uh, months later, more than three months later after these hurricanes. So. It's a, a timely discussion that uh, brings in the uh, the possibility of adding storage uh, to these existing PV systems. So I've had a NEM system myself for the past uh, two plus years, and I uh, decided uh, to plunk down some money to add a Tesla Powerwall, which is a 13 and a half kilowatt hour. Uh, battery storage uh, device with an integrated DC to AC inverter. So uh, essentially, you can take this uh, power wall and you can add it to uh, a large majority of the battery-less NEM systems across the state. And not that it's going to produce additional power because batteries don't produce power, they just store power. But it will provide, or would provide, the capability of having backup power in case the grid were to go down. So, you know, an interesting question that I've been pondering philosophically these past months is, you know, we live in a society where you pay insurance for lots of things in your life. You insure your home, you insure your health, you insure your vehicles, you insure your possessions, you insure, you insure, you insure. We're probably the most uh, insured uh, society and culture in the history of the planet, not necessarily the United States because of insurances has become a, a, a part of daily life, right? So to what extent will a homeowner who's already paying all these insurances see the, the value in plunking down money, either cash purchase or finance it, uh, to essentially buy an insurance policy by having battery storage like a Tesla Powerwall or others out there as well, not just Tesla that's offering this, that would provide power as an insurance policy in case the grid goes down? Mm -hmm. But you know, Marco, and that is a question that I think is going to be very interesting to see uh, as to what the adoption rate is going to be from these 80,000 or so grid-type PV system owners across the state. Will they be spending thousands of dollars as a reasonable insurance cost to bear in order to have that peace of mind? Now, as we know, uh, 
as long as the grid is on as stable as it is 99.9 something percent of the time people don't think too much about losing power but we all know that when they do lose power because of high winds like we had on this island a week or two ago uh, I read that uh, recently there were power outages in Honolulu that caused uh, Alamoana to, to go down and, and some of the vendors lost sales there yeah. so when we lose power we can become much more acutely aware of the vulnerability uh, and the dependence uh, that we have on having uh, electricity at our beck and call. So uh, I had a chance, like I said, to order uh, uh, order and install a power wall. So I'm just going to be playing with it, kind of putting it through its, uh, its paces and see how it, it performs. Um, and uh, you know, well, it's going to be uh, let me ask. what kind of demand there will be for retrofitting mm -hmm. existing NEM customers across the island uh, with uh, battery backup to provide them something that their existing TV system is not yeah. able to provide them. It's kind of a moving target, though, Marco, because, uh, you know, as we speak, um, <coughs> the utility, I mean, KIUC has also already installed a Tesla battery a uh, big Tesla battery in Kauai, and it's working on another one. Um, in the thought that it, you know, that the battery function resides with the utility, and I think uh, Hawaiian Electric is going in a similar direction, uh, looking for big battery installations. I think some are underway now. Um, at the same time, the utilities are trying to be more resilient, so that the, you know, the failure, the blackout rate is smaller. Hopefully, going forward. So the you know the, the percentage of risk for a given uh, solar owner or homeowner in general uh, being uh, you know abandoned and not not have any power in in, in a crisis uh, is is probably hopefully getting smaller. So here we have um, an expense that might be as much as your 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 original solar installation, effectively doubling the cost of your solar installation on your home. Um, I think a lot of the 80,000 people are not going to be willing to do that because they believe that ultimately the utility is the place where the battery system ought to reside. What's your answer to that? Well, Jay, you, you, you faded out a fair amount uh, in terms of me being able to really understand everything you said, but let, let, me, let me take a crack at what I think you asked. Uh, yes, uh, Kauai Island Utility Co-op has been at the forefront in the state in terms of integrating utility-scale battery storage with their newer uh, utility-scale PV arrays. And Hawaiian Electric uh, as well has been dabbling with utility scale battery storage, but it hasn't been uh, designed and we're not there yet where utilities in this state at least are, and, and I don't think in the rest of the country as well, are installing megawatt hours of battery storage as a backup in case one of their generators were to go down or they were to have a fault in a particular part of the grid. The utility scale battery storage, which has been installed to date, is typically there to write out uh, and smooth uh, the uh, the variable nature of uh, of renewable energies. You know, when the when the winds will pick up to a certain value and then die down within seconds, or when the sun pay, plays peekaboo behind clouds. So the there is no utility scale storage that I'm aware of, certainly not in this state and not in the, on the mainland where you have megawatt hours and megawatt hours worth of storage that are sitting there waiting in a fully charged mode to be able to provide power in case there are other failures in the grid. Well, Amina, what, what are your th yeah. thoughts about this issue? So, so Jay, I mean, basically in the Kauai system that the utility um, is relying on um, is to give to give the um, the system operators enough time to bring on their quick start generators because it's just far cheaper for them to bring on their uh, quick start diesel generators than to rely on batteries. So you know they they're just looking for that window of 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 storage to um, bring up their quick start generators. Yeah, but yeah, but Mina, you know, they've, they've got a very substantial uh, battery facility uh, with Tesoro, and uh, they're doing one with AES, and, and I, I heard also they're, they're doing, um, what, uh, pumped hydro. 
Uh, they got a big project for pumped hydro in Kauai. And it all, it all suggests yeah. that even if they don't have batteries and storage systems in place now that will work overnight, uh, that's, that seems to be a sea change that we should be watching. And maybe utilities around the state will be and doing I, that. And I, and I agree. And I agree, we should be watching. Um, you know, this is fairly new. They've only come on within the last year. And, and, and so th this is for dispatchable power um, from these power purchase agreements. And so, yeah, these are developments that we should be watching. Yeah, but I, but I agree with you that uh, right now we don't have it. I agree with Marco that we right now we don't have it and may, we may not uh, have it in substantial quantity, substantial enough to really cover the basis. So it's a, a legitimate question for every homeowner who doesn't have storage uh, to see what, what the economics are for him uh, or her and, uh, and maybe take a look at that in order to give, you know, to be more resilient in his own home. Well, anyway, we're out of time, you guys. Uh, thank you, Mina, as always. Thank you, Marco, as always. So enjoy having these conversations. They're elucidating for everyone, including me. Uh, and I look forward to talking with you guys again in two weeks hence. And in the meantime, I wish you a happy Christmas and the prospect of a wonderful new year. Aloha, you guys. And aloha to you both very, very much. I uh, really appreciate being able to have these, uh, do these shows with both of you. Thank you, Mina. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Thank you. 